Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, the goddamn puppy himself. It's Mr. Matt Freeman. <laughs> How's it going today, Matt? I'm just a cute little whelp. And, you, better, um, you better take your medicine. For, That's like for, the sixth time we've made a take your medicine joke in the intro. Is. For some reason, episode five. being an adorable puppy just triggers thoughts of extreme violence in you. I'm <laughs> Not really clear on why, but maybe we'll get into that later. This week on the show, we continue with part five of our ongoing series covering The Shining. This week, we're covering chapters 26 through 31. Danny's visit to room 217 wakes up old conflicts in the Torrance household as the three struggle with what the Overlook is doing. Danny decides to come clean and share everything he's seen and knows. Unfortunately, the elder Torrance doesn't do the same. Matt, what'd you think of this week's reading? Uh, I think The Shining is becoming one of my favorite um, maybe not even just King books, but just favorite books. Wow. Finding it extremely uh, emotionally affecting, psychologically rich. I'm really enjoying these conversations we're having. Like every, every week, I just feel like there's so much complexity and nuance and psychological realism to, to dig into and to mm-hmm. sort of, you know, hold up to the light and turn and, and examine from different angles. Um and so I say that because, you know, th- this week just kind of keeps getting better and better. There's so many things this week where I kept thinking to myself, like, and this is the part that like, like, this is the kind of thing that makes me love Stephen King. Um, <laughs> but it was like, it was like everything this week. Um, there's like some, some of his best stuff in my opinion. Um, so I, that's how I, I felt I, about this week. I love that. I love that you're thinking that it makes me so happy. And and I, I agree with you. I, I didn't. I did not expect this. Of course, I, I enjoy this book. I've read this book many times. I've never thought about this book. And if you asked me, you know, on a on a, on a, a night I was maybe a few drinks in, I maybe would have admitted I was a bit worried about uh, how much we were going to be able to to pull from this particular book, just because I remember it mostly as the the spooky book about being trapped in a hotel. But it is so rich. There is so much going on here. These characters are so well drawn and. Especially, you know, in, in comparison to, you know, I think one of the criticisms we had with, with Salem's Lot is a book that there was a lot going on in that book and we enjoyed reading it, but the characters felt a little a little shallow. Um, and here is not the case at all. We, we yeah. have these three incredibly, it's almost as if maybe, and I'm just supposing here, I don't know, but like King felt that criticism, like he went back and read that book or, 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 or was looking back on that novel and being like, you know, I need to work on my characters a little bit. I'm good. I, I'm good at setting plot. I've got these great, you know, side characters that I really like to develop. I really need to work on my characters. And the only way I can do that is locking myself in in a hotel and really working on it. But like, wait, no, I'll, I'll lock them, lock <laughs> them in the hotel and, and work on it. Um, and, and that feels like this is with the primary goal of this novel so far to me feels like just a character study really mm, that's, yeah. that's what it is yeah i think you're right and i mean maybe i'm being too specific here but i, I think about um the, the books of his that i've loved the most and it's, it's not a perfect correlation but i think i tend to like the ones where the character kind of sucks <laughs> um i mean you could put roland on this list because yeah. wh- while you know we while we love roland he's got a lot of these real classic jack torrance moments where you're just like oh my god i can't believe you did that um throughout the whole series really and that's for some reason just more compelling to me and Mm -hmm. there's other king books where the character is not a a dirt bag um who and 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 i still like the book quite a lot but it's just a pattern that i noticed that like that's just a really compelling type of character for me yeah you're right i think part of the appeal to roland is definitely that he's tottering on that edge kind of Mm -hmm. constantly throughout those novels for sure yeah all right um you want to you want to actually start talking about the (laughs) the book now i suppose (laughs) let's get into it uh we begin with chapter 26 titled dreamland our chapter begins with wendy asleep in a chair knitting and jack sitting down in the basement again leafing through old documents this time though matt tens of thousands of old milk bills. So so just just so we're all on the same page here, he hasn't worked on his play in weeks and is now spending his time inspecting individual milk bills uh-huh. because they might have 
some nebulous hint about the history of the Overlook or or something. Yeah, I love this as a way of showing the passage of time and the gradual slippage into obsession. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can explain away going through piles of lurid newspaper clippings as curiosity. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of interesting. You cannot sure. explain away individually sorting receipts from <laughs> milk purchases that happened decades ago. It's it's deranged behavior. Yeah, and, and if we continue to pull our... our metaphor of looking at papers as drinking um since the book i think wants us to do that maybe you could argue that his first little forays into it were you know more kind of social drinking you know just kind of a a beer after dinner or something and and looking at milk bills is is full-on binge drinking right you're you're Mm. not even you're not even enjoying yourself anymore you're just doing it yeah just doing it for for like it's a habit yeah no that mm-hmm. that's great i hadn't thought of it that way yeah I, I i'm glad you keep going back to that metaphor uh because it's not one that's occurring to me necessarily um but i, I do think that's it, it keeps working right it keeps paying dividends that's how you know it's yeah. a good metaphor when it keeps mm-hmm. kind of applying in different ways yeah yeah i, I kind of want to step back from the idea here and just say like the level of control and restraint that's required to write a character who is slowly losing his marbles as, as Jack is, Mm -hmm. is really, it's really hard. It's really hard to do that and not totally, you know, sort of prematurely overplay the hand and then you lose all connection with the character. It's really hard not to make it verge into basically farce where the character is just behaving absurdly. Um, it's it's just difficult for all sorts of reasons. And I, I find it remarkable that, you know, even up through the end of this chapter where Jack has really crossed some lines, mm-hmm. I don't feel like King has has verged into any of the typical failure modes of a character of this type. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Uh, that's a that's a good call. I think part of that is again his understanding of how to like pepper in the the sweet with the salt a little bit here. Mm-hmm. Like the idea that this week, this week's reading, we get some of the worst things Jack has said and done, uh, at least in the timeline of the novel so far. And at that same time, we also get this extended uh, flashback sequence where we just see how awful his childhood was and how awful his father was to him specifically. Mm-hmm. And so, like, you're 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 like mortified at this man and the things he's doing. But at the same time, you're like, oh, man, I feel bad for him, too. That's rough. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So the book, by the way, the book that Jack is is now definitely working on, will not be a hit piece, he says. He's he's go, going back on what he said last week. It's not a hit piece anymore because Jack has calmed down. Instead, it's going to be, Matt, it's going to be a, a straight-from-the-shoulder, incredibly accurate history of the Overlook. It's also going to open with Jack talking about the hallucination of the hedge animals he had, which is a weird thing to open your book on, but sure, okay. Um, and And the title, Matt, is... Strange Resort, the story of the Overlook Hotel, which this is a shitty fucking title. It's <laughs> awful. That's an awful title. Uh huh. I, I involuntarily imagined my eyes skimming over that title on a bookstore shelf without the slightest pause. What do you want to uh, title your your spooky, ghost ridden, but also possibly gangster ridden history novel or history nonfiction book about a hotel? strange resort uh-huh i mean i i don't know maybe it's it, like it just sounds so boring like i, I think mm-hmm. a, am i off base in thinking that this is a terrible idea and and the only reason jack thinks it's a good idea is because he's sort of hypnotized i i it just seems like a really stupid idea. Is it has to be like, yeah. I just like imagine, just put yourself in the mind of his New York city agent right now who thinks right now he's, he's finishing up a play that she actually quite liked the first time she read the bits of it that he's provided so far. He's supposed to be finishing up this play. Just imagine a world in which he calls her up and says, I got something new for you. And it's really exciting stuff. And it's like a 400 page history of the Overlook Hotel called Strange Resort. Uh huh. And she's just like, I can't, I can't sell this. Uh-huh. No, nobody's going to care about this. Yeah. Who cares about some random hotel in Colorado. Yeah. Right. It's not like, it's not like this is even, 
interesting nonfiction, really. I mean, it's, yeah. it, there's there's some gangster stuff, I guess. I guess there might be some subset of people who are interested in it. But, but you would only know that if you knew that. Yeah, like, right. like no, no one's going to know that just with by this title yeah. or, or, or like, I well, don't know. It's just like it's. Ugh. Well, so I, I'm thinking of In Cold Blood, which is number one, great title. Number yeah. two, about an extremely horrific event that everybody knew about. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes sense that you would write your Truman Capote. You're sitting there. You're saying this will make a great nonfiction book. Yeah. I will research this. I will dwell in the horror of this thing, but everybody already knows about it. That's the important thing. Yeah. So can you come up with a better title for uh, an, an overlook nonfiction novel? Um, no, no, I can't, <laughs> <laughs> man. I wanted to put you on the spot with that one. Um, it's not easy. Okay, we're not we're we're critics here. We're not creators. Okay? Yeah, not I'll uh, I'll come up with something later, and then you can just splice it in okay, right perfect. here. Oops, I forgot. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so so as Jack continues to read about gallons of milk being delivered, he slowly falls into a dream filled sleep, and we get more time to learn about how uh, much a piece of shit Jack's dad is. Um, which, by the way, that's going to be the the title of our future Lost podcast is just how much of a piece of shit Jack's dad is. Uh, that sounds perfect. Yeah. All right. So we're getting into Jack's childhood, Matt. You kind of predicted this a little bit, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, we we did know this was coming, right? The, the full details of Jack's buried traumatic childhood. Um, mm-hmm. It's It seemed like it was kind of underneath and behind a lot of the things that Jack was doing and saying for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we learn here that Jack's dad was a nurse, uh, a, a big man. He was 6'2", and also a piece of shit. But mm-hmm. like you mentioned last week about how the book is kind of constantly drawing ties between Danny and Jack and the things they're going through, I think we do it here again. As as this this past we're painting here shows Jack sitting in the hall playing with his trucks and patiently waiting for his daddy to come home, which is exactly how we met Danny. And this is this is intentional, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's intentional. The comparison is intentional. It's incredibly sad too. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of those little things that makes you have a pang of of understanding and, and sympathy yeah. for Jack. You know, he he uh, he wants to be the dad that he didn't have, but it's hard for him because, well, this is the example of a dad that he had. This is kind the of only the example. Yeah, this is what he's having to to bear the burden he's having to bear. Um, and again, it's it's the it's you're you're kind of of two minds about it because you're like, well, that doesn't excuse it, but it certainly makes you feel for him as a as a person. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Matt. I love the way Jack so casually describes the elevator game, in which in which you know his dad would come home and then quickly pick him up and and raise him up into the air, and then we get this. And there had been nights when his father, in his drunkenness, had not stopped at the upward lift of his slab muscle arms soon enough, and Jackie had gone right over his father's flat-topped head like a human projectile to crash land on the hall floor behind his dad. But on other nights, his father would only sweep him into giggling ecstasy, through the zone of air where the beer hung around his father's face like a mist of raindrops, to be twisted and turned and shaken like a laughing rag. So, like, <laughs> there's something really heartbreaking about that, right? Uh-huh. He's this kid that like is perpetually waiting for his dad to come home is so excited about it, but is also in this constant state of fear. Is tonight going to be a, a safe night or a night where I get launched over <laughs> my father, my six two father and go crashing to the ground? Yeah, no, I, I this was one of those moments where King is just finding and, and mashing all of these buttons in my head that <laughs> that make me just inwardly scream in horror. Um, cause I, I'm like involuntarily picturing, you know, lifting up my child and accidentally like flinging them into the air and they just, you know, tumble onto the ground in a, in yeah. a pile. I, you know, it, it reminds me of like every time I've, you know, even like, like while playing accidentally, like knocked one of my children over, which is the kind of thing that happens when you're roughhousing. And, and it's like, mm-hmm. even then you feel like horrible guilt. It's like seared into my memory forever. And, and like the child wasn't even hurt. Yeah. Um, so the idea that this guy is just routinely, you know, shot putting his, his son, um, down the hallway, uh, it, it's, it's, it makes me, um, makes me feel strong emotions. Like this is one of the things that makes me like yeah. this book so much is it's so good at locating these buttons that, um, I guess most authors don't go for cause, yeah. uh, man, the, it, it makes me, 
it makes me angry at this fictional character is what it does, which is it's you so, know remarkable. It's so specific. Like it's mm-hmm. once again, the specificity of it is where I think it, it sings because like, it's not just, Oh, we would rough house and you would hurt me sometimes. It's this very specific memory, this very specific elevator game, this thing that Dan- the Jack remembers fondly too, because mm-hmm. like, as we see here, maybe 50% of the time he, he got this thing where like he got to be, thrown around by his dad and and it, it made him laugh uncontrollably and there's this very fond loving memory of his father it's just half the time it was also uh, i got i got shot put <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, it's it's awful it's awful yeah. and like I, I like what you said like the idea that it's it's not just a thing that happened once it's a thing that happens enough to where it, there's a pattern to it and that mm-hmm. that makes it even even more disturbing yep um, from, from here, we move on to the souring of Jack and his father's relationship. And this is mostly around uh, his ninth birthday where he beats his mother bloody with a cane. Um, it's interesting because it's not like people like Jack's father need like an excuse to hurt people. He's just going to hurt people. But this savage beating of Jack's mother seemingly comes out of nowhere. Like in Jack's memory of the scene, his dad just asks for coffee. She opens her mouth to answer him and then is suddenly being beaten half to death. And and I guess I only bring this up because I just wanted to get your reaction to the the seemingly randomness of it. I mean, like this is a world where The Shining exists, right? So so are are we trying to say that that Jack's dad also had a little bit of The Shine, and perhaps his his wife said you know something in her mind, exasperating at, at him demanding coffee or something, and he picked up on it and decided to punish her for. It? I don't I don't know, but I, it's it's really interesting that. One of I think the things we're building here is not just not just the the anger and ferocity of this person, but the randomness of it that he was almost entirely unpredictable in his behavior. Yeah, um, I I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a good theory um, as to why, why now or what this means. Um, I I think the the randomness of it does strike me as sort of a king thing, though the idea that that that, that this is evil that just comes comes out of nowhere has no explanation Mm -hmm. is not rational i I mean i think i i think he literally says like he he calls it yeah in in a rational swipe of the of of the of the cane right and it's um it doesn't really like it's almost like the point of it is that it doesn't make sense to to me anyway i mean you you could totally be right it could be it could be sensical within within universe in some subtle way like that but to me it's almost more commentary of of how men like this and and, you know by extension men like jack they're always on the verge of boiling over really for no reason yeah um and they could explode at any moment um for for no no reason literally no reason um some something in his own mind uh was was triggered by something that no one outside of his mind will ever understand or appreciate and it, it like that that's that's the that's the terror of living around a man like this actually yeah and and by the way i i think you're right i i i think it's it's maybe just a fun exercise to kind of play the what is the universe explanation for this but i i do think i do think you're probably mostly right that the 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 fear of it is it's not understandable and and maybe unlike the overlook which has a a, a little dial that's showing the pressure building people don't have that and mm-hmm. so you have no idea what's going to happen and when yeah yeah um and then we have this little bit that i just wanted to to call out because it, it confirms something you predicted earlier um where we see the thing that he says to his wife as he beats her is na- he says i guess you'll take your medicine now goddamn puppy whelp come on and take your medicine so you predicted that this is probably something that Jack got from his father, and here you go, Matt. I'm uh, just giving you credit for being being correct. Yeah, um, I mean, appreciated, of course, but it, in my mind, it kind of made no sense otherwise because mm. uh, it's it's just such a random thing for Jack to be saying. And it, it what's interesting to me is it doesn't even make sense in this context. It makes no sense, right? It's like take your medicine is is a. Uh, uh, I don't know what the right word for this is, but like it's it's a phrase that that has become disconnected from any possible meaning that makes sense. Um, like for all we know, this is something that Jack's dad said to Jack's 
uh, sorry, Jack's dad's dad said to Jack's dad, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing that's interesting about it to me, this bit specifically is, is the puppy whelp language, um, which, so first of all, I didn't realize this, but whelp actually just means puppy. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I thought a whelp was, but a whelp is a puppy. And it's, and it's interesting because it's like, he's calling her a puppy as he savagely beats her. It's such like, this yeah. is one of those, like you said a second ago about like the specificity of it. It's such a specific thing. Like, like you, you, you can anticipate when you're, when you're reading about like a savage beating scene, you expect to read, like, maybe he's going to call her a bitch or something like that. Sure. But he calls her a puppy, which it, it's such a weird choice that it's, it's, it's like disarming in a way. You're, you're like, what, what is wrong with him? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, yeah, it might make sense like to refer to your kids that way as you're beating them savagely, I guess. But yeah, your wife, it it, it is interesting. Yeah, like and and it, it's a it's a defenseless diminutive. It's like a diminutive. It's a word you use. You're like you know, as you're playing with your kid, you're like you know, little puppy, you know. And it and he's using it while committing a violent act. It's it's mm -hmm. it makes it more shocking somehow. Like the contrast of it. Yeah. It's such an interesting choice. It is. And, and I like the, the, the take your medicine point. I like with the little factoid we got this week that his dad was a nurse, um, mm -hmm. which which is a really interesting choice, too, right? Because he's by profession a caretaker. Mm -hmm. Like that's what he's supposed to be doing is taking care of people like at his at his job. That's his job. And and at home, he's almost the exact opposite. And and so it's it's once again, you know, we talked about the fire hose and this 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 symbol of of you know a tool of safety, right? Being kind mm -hmm. of turned monstrous by this hotel. Um now we have this the nursing is like a symbol of health and and caretaking kind of ha flipped on it. You know, the take your medicine line is again kind of like taking something that's supposed this is gonna be good for you. It's gonna make you feel better. Um and, and that has been to kind of turned on its head as well. No, well, that's that's a great pull. I didn't can make the connection with him being a nurse because you can imagine if he if he has this ego problem like Jack does, where like he he thought he was destined for greatness and success and have everyone mm -hmm. worship him. And now he he is a a nurse, which it, it, you know, it's it's a it's it's one of those roles in society where it's like you know, someone who should really be celebrated much more than they are because they're, yeah. they're living this life of service, um, and, and giving, uh, but for him, he's, he doesn't want to be living a life of service and giving, right. He presumably he thinks he deserves better. Right. And, and so the idea of, of like he, all, all day long, he, he's got to get people to take their medicine and this has become like this giant totemic sign in his head mm -hmm. where like he, it, you're, you're suddenly you've made it make a lot more sense that this character would be saying, take your medicine while beating someone actually. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. It's also really interesting, you know, especially in the 1970s, nursing was a, a profession, you know, very female uh, oriented, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like so much to the point where when this book describes his father's profession, it says male nurse. Cause mm -hmm. it, you know, it can't just say nurse. It has to mm -hmm. say he was a male nurse. Um, and and I mean I think it is it is the, the profession is getting a little bit better in that in the years since this book came out but I, I don't there's nothing specific I want to pull out there because there's not really much to work with but perhaps that that feeds into into his, his father's ego problems that he's in a profession primarily dominated by women and so you know his boss is probably a woman right like it it doesn't go in and say this but probably a woman and maybe that's why he has such a problem with women and and why he's kind of passed this this problem with women onto his son because his dad cuz Jack seems to have a, an issue with women as well. Yes, yes. Sorry Scott, I just did a whole mental tangent about the character Gaylord Fokker in uh, um the um those comedy films. Um uh, he's Yeah, a, that was that was the 90s, right? And yeah. and it was already starting to get better in the 90s and we still had a whole joke routine about a male nurse thing, right? Exactly. This exactly. was the 70s. There were probably like four male nurses. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's you're right. No, I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm glad you kind of drew that into focus for me because I hadn't really made that connection with, mm -hmm. with his profession. I really love this writing here too. Jack, little Jackie now. He was little Jackie now dozing and mumbling on the cobwebby camp chair while their furnace roared into hollow life behind him. 
knew exactly how many blows it had been because each, each soft wump against his mother's body had been engraved on his memory like the irrational swipe of a chisel on stone. Seven wumps, no more, no less. And well, yeah, like you said, great writing. I think that's a fantastic metaphor. The the idea of an irrational swipe on uh, of chisel on stone because mm -hmm. it's it's a the metaphor being engraving, right? Being yeah. something that is perpetually engraved now, engraved not just on his mother's flesh but onto little Jackie's memory. Yeah, I also really am, I like the idea that the book draws this out, not only to say that, you know, Jack is kind of, you know, fixing his memory into the past, but, but that it's, it's little Jackie now on the chair. Like that, this is not Jack sitting in this chair dreaming. He's almost been transformed into little Jackie because it's little Jackie now dozing and mumbling on the cobwebby camp chair. Like it's, it's, it, you know, th this goes into what we talked about last week with the idea that while he was in the playground area, he was kind of, um, uh, reduced and, and, and regressed to a younger version of himself. And the same thing is happening again here as he goes through this old memory. Yeah. Um, is it, has this happened more than twice? I'm trying to figure out if this is like a, a three beat with the, um, Jack regressing. Um, but anyway, I don't yeah, I believe we've seen another one yet, but you're totally right that it is a, a, a point that keeps being brought up. Mm -hmm. So we learn, Matt, in this moment and, and Jack's mother's uh, choice to kind of cor corroborate his dad's story of her just falling down stairs uh, instead of being beaten by a cane kind of broke their family. The kids started to leave one by one to get away from the dad. Uh, then not too long after that, Jack's dad had a stroke while at work and died. Um, and, and I kind of I wanted to use this as another comparison point between Wendy and Jack's mom, because I think it's it's worth comparing these two as well, because Wendy was also someone who had witnessed violence by her spouse and chose to stay anyway. Um, it was not violence against her. I, th I don't think the book has said that Jack has harmed Wendy at all uh, at this point. Uh, that's correct, right? I don't think he's done right. anything. Right, correct, yeah. And, and the interesting thing about this to me is that while Jack doesn't come right out and say that little Jackie was as disgusted by his mother's choice to stay and defend uh, her husband as his older brothers were, because we see that those two children were absolutely disgusted by it. I do think that's kind of the implication. And that I think to me perfectly goes back to what you were talking about last week about the idea that hate people hate themselves. And then uh, people that hate themselves end up hating the people that love them because they hate, they love a person that they hate. Mm. And, and so it, it leads me to this idea. Like I wonder this moment when Wendy almost, breaks it off almost asks for a divorce as much as he wanted her to stay i wonder if part of jack hates wendy for choosing to stay still yeah sure i, I think you're right i mean how dare she be complicit in covering for that monster jack torrance <laughs> um yeah I, I i we know he he is uh, capable of that level of double think so yeah no certainly makes sense mm-hmm so from here, Matt, the, the dream kind of loses focus a little bit as, as the little boy sitting on the steps waiting for his dad kind of transforms into the little boy Danny in his room messing up Jack's papers, then transforms into Jack's mom's face, uh, which I wonder, you know, if we if we connect that to the guilt he's feeling about Danny, I wonder if there's any guilt towards his mother that Jack's feeling some unacknowledged repressed guilt here as well. Um, and then suddenly Jack is standing in front of the CB in, in, in Ullman's office. He's sleepwalked. He's here. Suddenly, uh, we, we learn here that this is the only link to the outside world and his father is on it talking to him and his father is saying, you have to kill him, Jackie and her too, because a real artist must suffer because each man kills the things he loves because they'll always be conspiring against you, trying to hold you back and drag you down right this minute. The boy of yours is where he shouldn't be trespassing that's what he's doing he's a goddamn little pup cane him for it jackie cane him within an inch of his life have a drink jackie my boy and we'll play the elevator game um <laughs> so there's a lot there's a lot there matt uh -huh. there's a whole lot there yeah i mean i guess the, the first thing that jumps into my mind here is you know once again we have the, the this this idea that the hotel has sort of shown our various characters these these things that whether or not they're real 
um, up until this point, nobody has actually been harmed directly. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. then Jack is the one who is sort of manipulated into smashing the, the radio here. Like, yeah. like it's it's literally the hotel makes him think that that the radio is like saying these things to him, and he smashes the radio. I, I don't know if it's quite literal, but it's maybe that's the implication. Um, am I am I reading too much into that? Is that not exactly what happens? I I think. You're right. I think this is probably one of the most active, direct, like pushes we've seen coming from the hotel that that, I mean, I I think I do think the scene is kind of intentionally dreamlike and nebulous enough to where you could perhaps make the argument that it was all in his head. Mm -hmm. But I think we've I think we've passed that point by now. I think we've crossed that threshold the second a ghost grabbed Danny and and pulled him back into a hotel room. Well, so that's the that's the when when I said up till this point, I guess I was. I was pretending that we didn't know that the ghost had actually <laughs> harmed Danny. But, uh-huh. but of course, interestingly, it's like it only harmed Danny enough to cause a massive rift in Jack and Winnie's relationship. Yeah. Like it didn't it, – it, it literally harmed him just enough to leave bruises that would then become a massive issue, right? Yeah. I mean this is something I wanted to talk to you about this week and I guess we'll jump ahead a little bit and do it right now because it, it, Danny's story is basically like she was choking me and then I passed out. And then I woke up. Right. Um, and I'm here now. And right. I think it's funny. The movie just kind of deals with this by having him go catatonic and then waking up. And then there's no time to actually talk about any of this ever. But it's it's so funny. There's just like, and then she just let me go. Right. The end. Um, yeah. It's it's really, really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I I think genuinely that whatever sentience is, is operative here is not really interested in just killing the kid directly Mm -hmm. with with the hotel ghost magic yeah um maybe it can't i don't know that's that's um still unclear to me what it can and can't do sure but it wants jack to i mean if if, (laughs) if we're reading this and saying like this is the hotel directly talking to him via the cv it certainly wants him to yeah um i do i'm I'm really interested in the idea of it it's saying because a real artist must suffer, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's, it's such an interesting phrase to throw in here because it's supposed to be coming from Jack's father Mm -hmm. technically who was not an artist and probably would never have said that phrase ever. Um, but, but it's also playing into exactly what I think Jack imagines for himself as the starving, suffering artist, you know, like the guy that, that, I mean, I think he's suffered enough tragedies in his childhood that he doesn't need, he doesn't need any more suffering stories to be a a suffering artist. But I just love the detail of that. It's like just just kind of thrown in there. Yeah, sure. I I think this is one of those things that makes you realize that this is an entity wearing the mask of his father who's sort of just pushing his buttons. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I love it, like have a drink, Jackie, my boy, and we'll play the elevator game. Because you know, talking about what we were talking about before, like this is this is the vice of his early of his late life is having the drink, and then the elevator game was this th- thing of his childhood, this this totemic point of his childhood before he lost the love and and respect for his father because mm-hmm. he really like it's I don't know it's just it's really great everything everything here is is just great. Yeah, it's a really tight paragraph. You're right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the result of this whole thing is that Jack flips out, uh, smashes the CB radio to bits, cutting them off from the outside world. Uh, he's screaming as he does this. He screams, you're not in me at all. So this, he's going, he's yeah. doing great, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Everything is going great. Yeah. <laughs> and this is of course the moment that Wendy finds him because <laughs> he heard him screaming. She heard him screaming and, and runs up on him and finds him standing over the, absolutely dev- demolished cb radio screaming so mm-hmm. that's great yeah and so we cut right to this moment in chapter 27 catatonic from wendy's point of view we see her, her point of view as she rushes up to jack and i love this this part right here so much matt the bewilderment se- the bewilderment seemed to grow and for a moment she saw his true face the one he ordinarily kept so well hidden and it was a face of desperate unhappiness, the face of an animal caught in a snare beyond its ability to decipher and render harmless. Then the muscles began to work, began to writhe under the skin. The mouth began to tremble infirmly. The Adam's apple began to rise and fall. That's so good. Like yeah. for a moment, the true nature of Jack Torrance was revealed to her as this this miserable animal. And then the way he writes the face going back into Jack form 
it's then it's not his muscles, right? This is the, the, the word choices here again. Then it's think of how different it would be if it, then his muscles began to work, began to writhe under the skin, his mouth began to tremble, his Adam's apple began to rise and fall. No, the use of the there, like, like separates it from humanity, right? It, it's it's inhuman almost. Yeah, it's like a the, a, a process that is happening. Not, yeah, yeah. Not Jack doing it. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Uh, so Jack collapses on Wendy weeping, and for a brief moment, we think that maybe things will all be okay. That he's going to finally come forward and console her. That this experience is enough to wake him up to what's going on. Um, uh, to wake them all the fuck up, but uh, but not. That's not. That's not what happens, Matt. No, yeah, that's that's true. I mean, as ri- as ridiculous and bad as this looks for Jack in this moment, um, this might have been a sort of wedge into which some compassion could be lodged. Yeah, um, yeah. But but instead, it's a wedge that the hotel takes advantage of to drive them further apart by yep yep by dropping Danny into the middle of this moment. Yeah, um, and th- I mean that's that's what happens in this moment, right? Because they're like he's beside himself crying in front of her which which wendy notes here is, is something that jack rarely does if ever and, and how big of a deal it is um then she asks him where danny is and he says i don't know isn't he with you he wasn't downstairs with you he looked over his shoulder and his face tightened at what he saw on her face never gonna let me forget that are you wendy um yeah so here we go here we go yeah we, we begin to drive in that wedge right it, it, it I think this is exactly what Jack has thought in his mind before when mm-hmm. when he saw Wendy, you know, get giving him concerned looks. Yeah. But now now he says it aloud. And that to me, that's kind of the uh the, the screw that keeps turning this week actually is Jack's previously sort of totally internalized annoyance toward maybe maybe hatred toward Wendy is mm-hmm. is becoming externalized as the tension ramps up. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I love about this is that King doesn't actually allow quote unquote us to see what was on Wendy's face there. Like there, there's no descriptive moment in which we see what was on Wendy's face. We just see him look at it and decide what it means. And I think that's especially interesting considering we were just in her head moments ago, right? We, we saw her approach Jack from her point of view. We saw what she was thinking. We thought saw what she was going through. And in this moment, King denies that to us. We don't actually see it, which to me like causes us, I think, to doubt Jack's read on the situation a little bit. King is trying to show us that perhaps Jack is taking meaning here that there shouldn't be, and he is acting absurd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's an interesting reading of that. Yeah, I like that. And, and then, so he kind of blows up at her, um, and she kind of storms off. And then, at right as she walks out of the room, we get this part: "Wendy, I'm sorry. It was the dream. I'm upset." forgive of course she said her face not changing expression (laughs) and i think this is the perfect distillation of the wendy jack dynamic right you know he he oversteps he gets mad she gets upset at him for it he says i i I, for some reason i just really like grokked onto the idea that he doesn't even say do you forgive me like just the idea like i'm sorry it was the dream i'm upset forgive you know, like, like it's just so it's childish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then of course she, she says, of course, but of course she does not, her face does not change expression. She has not loosened. She's not like, it, it, and you're just going to rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just adding to the pile of polite fictions that they have to maintain, mm-hmm. you know, forever now in, in their marriage, just a- adding to the script of perpetually rehearsed internal copes and seethes that yeah. they already reiterate endlessly. I mean, Mainly Jack, but also it's. Get, I think it's getting to be the case for Wendy that there's so much shit that she has to sort of overlook. Yeah, that that has been building up gradually, and and really it was the case even before they got here. But now it's just so hard to not see, you know, mm-hmm. um, so hard to keep telling herself that story about how Jack is totally going to get better and everything's going to be great now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right there. Um, so, so they rush off together to find Danny, and they find him. They he's he's sitting at the top of the steps on the second floor, catatonic with bruise marks all around his neck. Wendy, we see, just immediately decides that Jack must have done it, and and later we'll see that she actually harbors a lot of guilt over this. That the fact that she gave him none of the benefit of the doubt here, but like, 
come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> of, of course Jack did it. <laughs> like in a world where we're not going to immediately go, oh, well, a ghost did it. Then there's literally nobody else. There's three people in this hotel. One of them has hurt the other one in the past. C- c- come on. <laughs> uh-huh. We we know who did this, right? Yeah. No, I mean, um, if if anything, the insane thing is that Jack doesn't immediately jump to accusing Wendy because mm-hmm. he should be thinking exactly the symmetrical thing of there are strangulation injuries on my kid. I didn't do it. You must have done it. Yeah. Uh, but but he, like he totally fails to jump to that conclusion. Yeah. Um, which tells you where his head is at. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because that's the most wonderful part about this. The reason he doesn't like immediately deny the accusation or throw it back at her is because he's like, no, wait, maybe. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, because he he just like kind of woke up from a sleepwalking dream, standing over a CB radio, destroying it. So like this idea that I'm capable of this mm-hmm. and and kind of admitting to himself or maybe not like allowing himself to slightly admit that he is totally capable of doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to get all galaxy brain here, but I, I do keep harping on this idea that King has, has been so careful to never really give us anything definitive indicating that these, that these things are anything other than hallucinations. And, and so you could say here, Matt, you're, you're full of shit. Danny has bruises on his neck. And I could say, it's possible that Danny just kind of blacked out and then Jack in his like dream fugue actually did do this. I, I admit that the logistics of that happening are are kind of a stretch. It's getting more complicated every it, week it, it, to, well, to keep building that narrative. Yeah, it, exactly. It becomes a, yeah, yes, it becomes strained. Right. But I, I, it's not that I bring it up to say like, I think this is really what's happening and you're wrong. I mm-hmm. think it's, it's that the author is continually letting us have just the possibility of that out so that there's some ambiguity but he's making that less le- less and less likely every week basically sure sure yeah so wendy rushes off with danny leaving jack alone here and he sits here thinking about it and he says had he maybe hurt danny as wendy thought tried to strangle his son at his dead father's request no he would never hurt danny he fell down the stairs doctor he would never hurt danny now He could. How could I know the bug bomb was defective? Never in his life had he been willfully vicious when he was sober. Except when you almost killed George Hatfield. No, he cried into the darkness. Um, this is actually interesting. I, 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 maybe I just totally missed this, but he fell down the stairs. Doctor, did they lie to the doctor about how Danny's arm got hurt? I don't remember. I, I I, I thought they didn't. I thought they told the doctor the truth that, that he, you know, he, uh, grasped him too firmly when he was punishing. Mm-hmm. I, I thought they were truthful, but no, I, no, I, I think it's being paralleled to, I mean, obviously it's being paralleled to, to his mother and, and yeah. the, the, the feeling of shame at, at injuring his son being paralleled to, to what his father did to his mother and, and that invoking all those emotions and yeah, um, yeah. H- him, him relating himself to his father, which, which is just a horrible thought to him. Um, sure. Sure. But no, I love the parentheticals, the injection of the parentheticals, <laughs> um, the, the the all of his copes are, are breaking down as as he he can no longer really look at himself with a straight face, um, yeah. and and I adore that we hear this this no that he screams out from Winnie's perspective, like it, it, in the next bit, and we see how deranged his behavior looks from the outside. Yeah, yeah. My my, my all time favorite one is he would never hurt Danny. It, he would never hurt Danny now. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right that his his whole narrative he's built for himself is is collapsing around him. Mm-hmm. So we now move back with Wendy as she tries desperately to figure out what to do next. The big question on her mind here is exactly how dangerous is Jack? Did he do this in his right mind or not? And if not, couldn't he be trusted to help them get Danny out of here? Because she knows that no matter what, now that they need to do that, now they need to get Danny out of here. Um, and mm-hmm. she she's kind of torn between this thing of do I trust this man enough to go out there and say, Hey, we need your help to get Danny out of this hotel. And she's just not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the, um, I, I love the, the sort of shift in Wendy's thinking, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where, um, it, like, like she becomes a lot colder. I, I didn't pull the exact, 
um, quote, but it's like the, the the cold voice of her motherhood or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like the, this brutal pragmatism takes her over, and and she you know she realizes like my husband has has become a potential obstacle to my son's survival, so um, I'm gonna throw him under the bus immediately um, mm-hmm. and 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 not feel bad about it at all. It's, it's great. <laughs> yeah especially I, I like I like this part here. She was now aware that she had made one bad decision when she had gone against her feelings and Danny's and allowed the snow to close in on them for Jack's sake. Another bad decision when she had shelved the idea of divorce. Now she was nearly paralyzed by the idea that she might be making another mistake, one she would regret every minute of her every day for the rest of her life. It's really interesting to think about this, this idea that she's in this moment now like, okay, um, he he beat my kid again. I fucked up. I fucked up a bunch of times and now we need to get out of here. I'm going to leave him. We're going to get out of here. And then like we leave the, this week's chapters and you don't know what's going to happen next, but we, we do know that they're not going to be leaving the hotel next. Uh So like you kind of start to wonder how much, like once she actually starts to buy into the idea that perhaps Jack didn't do this, like how much of this is just going to be immediately reversed in her mind? Are things just going to like go back to normal after this week's reading? Are we just going to be good again? Yeah. That's that's the fascinating thing about Wendy's character is she's, she's the, the other side of this, right? Where, Mm -hmm. where every time Jack crosses the line and she thinks to herself, Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And then she has to tell herself the story which Jack, of course, helps, you know, sustain this illusion of like, oh, yeah. it won't happen again, won't happen again. It, it's because of the alcohol. It's because of the stressful job. It's because yeah. of the book isn't going well. It's because, it, and, uh, you know, okay, all right, fine. Like, I, you know, l- l- I, people make mistakes, I guess. I, you know, and so like she, she, she participates in the narrativizing, right? And that's, that's yeah. kind of like, that's like what a bad marriage is, is just like a mutually perpetuating narrative yeah. structure that is that, that requires more and more, more energy to maintain over time and she's got her own insecurities and issues coming into it as well right like this this idea that like she proves her mother right if she can't make this marriage work because her mom didn't like jack mm-hmm. thought jack was bad and useless and then like she doesn't want to prove her right because she's got all the, these issues with her mom she's also got that pressure we talked about with the doctor said like this kid will be fine as long as he's got his mom and dad happy together. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's so funny. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So she's, she's got a lot of pressures on her, you know, guiding her into these decisions for sure. But yeah. Um, but at least in the moment, she decides that she has no other choice. She can't get down from this mountain by herself. So she goes and finds Jack to ask him for help to get Danny out of here. Um, she is summoned to his location by him singing his, this is really wonderfully written, his quote, rich, angry, and bitterly satiric singing. It's great. Uh, and then we move into the next chapter to find out why Jack is singing. Uh-huh. Oh my God. So, so creepy because, because we, we cut away from him. We, we heard this, we heard him shout out, no, and now he's singing. Yeah. And we're like, oh Christ, what, what, is, what, <laughs> what now? Yeah. What now, Jack? So chapter 28 titled, It Was Her. And as you said, we get to learn what Jack was doing while Wendy and Danny were hiding from him in their room. And if you guessed that he uh, dealt with this whole situation calmly, rationally, and maturely, um, you lose the prize. The, the, the sentence of the chapter is, she had no goddamn right <laughs> to, to do what, J- Jack? Uh-huh. So let's just set the stage here, right? Let's, let's let's not lose focus. Let's not get lost in the forest. Jack's son is currently catatonic. He is not responding. He's got bruises all around his neck like someone's been choking him or at least grabbing him very roughly. Jack knows that he didn't do it. I put quotes around that because he doesn't know for sure, but he, he's had time to collect himself and it's kind of decided that he's pretty confident that he didn't do it. But that means someone is here if it's not wendy right so there, regardless something is seriously terrifyingly wrong with his son right people just don't just go catatonic you know uh-huh. and, and what is he doing is is he rushing to his son's side is he at least trying to go to the door that wendy has locked and saying wendy you know i i, I swear to you i didn't do this i don't know what's going on i'm scared i'm worried about him let me help let me help is he doing that no no He's wandering around the hotel complaining about her 
inability to forgive him for things that he has done <laughs> uh-huh. recently. Yeah. How how dare she? Yeah. How You're... she has no goddamn right yeah. to think that the only other person in this hotel choked my son yeah i mean it's it's interesting because you're you're right like the quote she has no goddamn right no goddamn right to what to be angry to Mm -hmm. to be suspicious to have the most plausible rational thought about the situation (laughs) Uh um yeah no he never actually tells her that he didn't do it by the way right he he's so kind of in the moment like flabbergasted and he starts to tell her but he he doesn't ever, ever actually get the words out i didn't do this yeah, right, and 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 then doesn't doesn't move to correct it. It doesn't even occur to him. Yeah, until like until like you know, I we don't actually have like a clock on the wall here, but it feel it feels like fifteen minutes pass before it even occurs to him <laughs> yeah. that he should do something about this, right? Uh huh. Uh-huh. And this is this is great. Like this is some of the stuff I was talking about at the very beginning when I said like this is just my favorite stuff because. Like I've known since the beginning of this book that we were going to take Jack in the direction where he, you know, becomes unsalvageably mad one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, the only question was, you know, is this going to be like something external, something borderline magical that gradually overcomes the character? Or is it going to be more of an interior, internal deterioration, a, a more organic kind of madness that's more character driven? Um, and I, I was hoping it would be the latter. I was hoping it would be the the more organic, character driven madness because that feels more authentic and interesting. And and I'm like relieved, I guess, that that's like the direction we're going, where mm-hmm. where none of none of what's happening here really feels like this character is doing anything that Jack Torrance wouldn't have done anyway if he had been, you know, pushed right. Mm-hmm. Not even requiring supernatural intervention, just if his life just got a little bit more stressful, you know, one more George Hatfield situation came along. Sure. You can imagine him just kind of snapping, uh, especially if he's in an isolated hotel. And I just, I don't know. I love it. I I love the, I love everything about this, this chapter. Um, Yeah. No, you're you're so right. And and I think that's what, that's uh, what I love most about Jack's deterioration is, is of course we've seen kind of textually the hotel is pushing, right? The radio just, I, I think you're absolutely right that what he's, what, what it did to Danny was almost specifically designed to drive a wedge between these people. It's like, mm-hmm. Oh, you have these people who have this ongoing conflict about uh, abusing the child. Well, let's just give them a little bruises and, and throw them back out there and see what happens. Yeah. Um, it, but, but it is still, at the end of the day, this is kind of what I talked about last week. Like the, it's given, it's given them the keys. They're still walking through those doors uh, into the Colorado lounge, mm-hmm. which is yeah. exactly where Jack ends up as he walks uh, into the bar for a moment there. We see he, he sees it as a fully stocked bar, he even smells all of the fresh beer and, and liquor that kind of hover around the bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's something incredibly delightful about all these kind of ambiguous hallucinations where, you know, they're they're neither full on hallucinations like the topiary animals were, nor are they unambiguously just, oh, this is just simply Jack's imagination. Mm -hmm. This whole scene is rife with these kind of half hallucinations. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And of course, it's actually really empty because everyone knows that ghosts don't know how to distill and bottle liquor. Come on, Matt, you know that. No, um, but that doesn't stop Jack from sidling up to the bar and ordering a drink or twenty. Uh-huh. He orders twenty drinks, Matt. Twenty martinis, which uh-huh. I enjoy a, I enjoy a good martini every once in a while, you know. But uh-huh. sure, tw- twenty of that's, those. <laughs> that's basically like a bottle of vodka. Yeah. <laughs> um, Matt, this whole scene, I I can't. It's so good. It's so good. I'm I'm kind of overwhelmed with the pressure of like talking about how to explain or analyze writing this freaking good. It feels like this is the moment we've been building to almost the entire time with Jack. It feels like this very moment. Mm-hmm. And I'll read a bit of, a bit of it for you here, and we can talk about it. Hi, Lloyd. He said, "A little snow to- slow tonight, isn't it?" Lloyd said it was. Lloyd asked him what it would be. Now I'm really glad you asked me that, Jack said. Really glad, because I happen to have two twenties and two tens in my wallet, and I was afraid they'd be sitting there until sometime next April. There isn't a seven eleven around here, would you believe it, Lloyd? And I thought they had seven elevens on the fucking moon. Lloyd sympathized. <laughs> so the the choice here to make Lloyd, who isn't real, 
Um, mm-hmm. Not an active, like not an active delusion mm-hmm. that is that it's not, he, he is responding, but, but we don't give Lloyd dialogue, right? Uh-huh. We just do these, these sentences. Lloyd said it was Lloyd yeah. asked him what it would be. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, so it, good. It's this, it, this indirection. It's so creepy. Mm-hmm. Like, cause it is, no, it is. nobody does this. Like, I mean, <laughs> think how totally and completely different this would be if King had just said, Jack imagined his old bartender Lloyd standing mm-hmm. behind the bar and then you put in all the proper quotation marks and he says and so forth. It would read totally differently. But as it is, it's it's this like ethereal presence of Lloyd where you're like, is there is there somebody there? <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, I admit, I admit, you know, part of this is me being cued by the film um, where mm-hmm. Lloyd is totally there. But yeah, but I mean, I think it shows that even Kubrick, like the only the only possible interpretation of the scene is we just need to put a person there and have him actively talking. Yeah. And it's not that that scene isn't creepy because I think both the performance of Lloyd and, and Nicholson's Jack is just aces in the scene, which, which I think as you realize took a lot of the dialogue straight, it, straight yes. from the book here. Yeah. I- including the uh, white man's burden quote, which makes <laughs> no sense. It makes no sense in either in, context. In, in either but context. I, I found it I found it delicious here that yeah. he just says it and you're just like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. No, I I thought it was original to the film because because there's this reading with the film where there's like this subtext of Native American massacre and stuff. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But no, it's in the book too. Okay. Fine. <laughs> he just says it. He just says white man's burden. I don't uh-huh. know. It's so great. Yeah. So Jack pops back some Excedrin while miming drinking his 20 martinis, and he suddenly gets the feeling he's being watched here, Matt. But but not just watched. We see here he had a sudden sensation that people were watching him, curiously and with some contempt. The booths behind him were full. They were graying, distinguished men and beautiful young girls, all of them in costume, watching this sad exercise in the dramatic arts with cold amusement. But of course, as he turns around, no one's there. I just find it really fascinating that like whether this is all in his imagination or is this actual the actual ghosts of the hotel appearing to watch him. The idea that Jack assumes that he's being watched curiously and with contempt, that these people are kind of laughing at him, that like 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 I think one of the things he says is they're like, um, you know, holding their hands in front of their face to to hide their laughter as they're laughing at him just goes into this this perpetual jack you know uh woe is me everybody hates me mm-hmm. everyone's laughing at me like into his into his as you said his his whole problem from his beginning which is with with his pride yeah yeah and beginning to become paranoia even um like this 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 feeling like you just said that everyone is 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 against him um and mm-hmm. that if, you know of, of course if there are if there were people watching they would be laughing at me um because that's how he feels about himself, right? It's ex- mm-hmm. it, it's projection, really. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, from here we move on to Jack's monologue about the the proverbial wagon here, and this is another one of those things that I'm just like, holy shit, where did this writing come from? It, it, it this whole thing is in and itself a, a work of art the way he describes the wagon. Um, Mm -hmm. And I haven't pulled the whole thing because it's very long, but I I wanted to pull this part at least. Then you start to see things, Lloydie, my boy, things you missed from the gutter, like how the floor of the wagon is nothing but straight pine boards, so fresh they're still bleeding sap. And if you took your shoes off, you'd be sure to get a splinter, like how the only furniture in the wagon is these long benches with high backs and no cushions to sit on. And in fact, there are nothing but pews with a songbook every five feet or so. Like how all the people sitting in the pews on the wagon are these flat-chested Albertos in long dresses with a little lace around their collar and their hair pulled back into buns until it's so tight you can almost hear it screaming. And every face is fiat, is flat and pale, and they're all singing, shall we gather at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river. And up front there's this reeking bitch with blonde hair playing the organ and telling him to sing louder, sing louder. And somebody slams a songbook into your hands and says, sing it out, brother. If you expect to stay on this wagon, you're going to sing morning, noon, and night especially at night. And that's when you realize what the wagon really is, Lloyd. It's a church with bars on the windows, a church for women and a prison for you. Um, 
So Jack uh, hates women. I think uh-huh. we can just go ahead and say that definitively yeah. now. No, the, it is fascinating how it manages to be an extremely pointedly misogynistic rant. Like there's uh-huh. there's like five different specific misogynistic things in there. Mm-hmm. It's not an accident. This isn't random, right? This is yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the last line is like women, yeah. women, um, and you're like. <laughs> I mean, it, it, like, like you said, amazing writing. It's amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. Part of it, uh, part of me is like, where is this coming from? And then, and then I'm like, well, no, I know. I mean, this has been under the surface the whole time. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of shocking to see it all spill out so um, colorfully. Yeah, yeah. He's been keeping this in, and he's finally getting to 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 let it out. Um, mm-hmm. And I, uh, I don't want to read too much into this, but I, I love the idea of the uh, at the front of the wagon the 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 reekin bitch with blonde hair playing the organ you know like uh-huh. wendy has blonde hair yeah um i, I yeah I sing louder sing like louder it's, yeah. like I, it's gotta be like he's 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 putting wendy on this person whether yeah. he means to consciously or well, not no no I, I i definitely agree because it's it's wendy is is the is the villain in mm-hmm. his in his little world that he's constructing where yep. wendy's the one who has has badgered him into not drinking because because well we won't talk about the because um uh for reasons that she has made up um in her mind <laughs> um you know like like it's all wendy it's all wendy's yeah. fault right like that's the, that that's what he's building toward um you know what's really interesting in this it, it, i don't think we've ever talked about this but the the reason that jack quit drinking is because they ran over a bike and thought they might have killed a child mm mm-hmm. mhm and that has kind of been completely forgotten recently mm-hmm. whenever he's referring to drinking. Yeah. He's just not thinking about that reason anymore. Like, yeah, again, he's, he's pivoting the blame. It's Wendy. It's Wendy making me do this. It's Wendy lack of trust in me. It's she's driven me to drink. Like he's completely forgotten that he, he kind of decided on his own to go sober. It had nothing to do with her. She was ready to say, fuck you. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, it, it's that moment that, that really pushes him to sobriety. Actually. You're totally right. I mean, I, I feel like probably the visceral emotional impact of that moment has faded. And now there's just this woman in yeah. his life. Who's, who's kind of insisting that he continue to not drink when uh, the, the sort of, impetus for it has faded Mm -hmm. yeah uh so finally after once again attempting to see all the people that are gathering around and watching him and laughing at him jack comes to his senses and as you said perhaps 15 maybe 20 minutes later says wait a minute what am i doing here (laughs) (laughs) oh my god what am i what was he doing sitting here and talking to himself like a sulky teenager when his son was upstairs someplace acting like something that belonged in a padded room and so he finally decides that he needs to 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 go there. Uh, and it is, of course, at this moment that Wendy finds him, Danny in her arms. Um, he finally says to her what he should have said the first time. He didn't touch Danny. He didn't lay a hand on him. But as Wendy tries to tell Jack that they need to leave, Danny wakes up enough to start screaming and seizing. And I love this line as 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 Jack maybe fully understands the the scope of what Danny has been through. He says, what hole had his son poked through and into what dark nest and what had been there to sting him? You know, we're, we're really loving this wasp nest metaphor here. No, it's, it's great. Yeah. It's my favorite. Danny gains just enough consciousness to see his daddy and run to him saying it was her in a shocking role reversal and a, a shocking cliffhanger. Oh my God. <laughs> in this chapter on. Yeah. An unusually cliffhanger chapter ending for, for mm-hmm. Stephen King here. Fortunately, it wasn't the end of this week's reading, Matt, though. Yes. Because <laughs> you yes. would have killed me. I would have, yes. So we move on to chapter 29, Kitchen Talk. And and we see here that despite that wonderful cliffhanger from the last chapter, we basically resolve that immediately. We put aside that conflict totally. Um, you know, Jack doesn't sit there and, and, and re- accuse Wendy or legitimately think Wendy is responsible for this. He, he just kind of admits that, there's no way she ever would have done it. He says, he says, I do believe it. He said, although he had to admit to himself that it gave him a certain amount of pleasure to see the shoe switch to the other foot with such dazzling, unexpected speed. But his anger at Wendy had only been a passing gut twitch. 
In his heart, he knew Wendy would pour a can of gasoline over herself and strike a match before harming Danny. So we don't really do anything with this, right? We don't do anything with this this line of conflict, which which perhaps begs the question, why do it at all? What do you um, think? Well, so I, I think number one, just to kind of lash out at her to express some of that anger that's been building up inside of him and to make her feel mm-hmm. a fraction of the guilt and confusion and pain that he feels. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, I think this is it's one of the problems with a really bad relationship is that the, 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 the you can normalize lashing out in this way because it's just like, it, kind of like his, his half-assed, like f- forgive, um, earlier where it's it's like well if she's gonna forgive me anyway then why don't i do it? then why not just lash out why not just mm-hmm. say these shitty things that i'm thinking um, sure sure yeah I, I think you're right there to me i think it's more about wendy than it is about him uh the, the the reason to include it in the story is more to to kind of start poking wendy at at her places as well because mm-hmm. you know we see this part here as jack is feeding danny a drink um we see that that Jack nodded and Danny drank again. Wendy felt the familiar twist of jealousy somewhere in her middle, knowing the boy would not have drunk it for her. So like this combined with the, the sudden accusation of, were you the one that did this is, is what kind of activating all Wendy's insecurities and how, you know, we're we're talking about the way that hotel is perhaps trying to drive a wedge using Jack, but, but it's probably doing something similar with Wendy as well. Um, And it causes her to go into this kind of spiral of self doubt and guilt. Like, Am I like my mother? Um, d- d- was I wrong for immediately accusing Jack of doing this? Does that make me lo- more like my mom if I do that? W- w- like just this idea of like every choice she has to make in her life is loaded with this idea of how does that make me more or less like my mother who I hate? Yeah, no, I I, I like that. I think that's um, that's very likely, and and I I agree that just like like standing back you know um doyalistically the reason to include it is definitely what you just said that that we mm-hmm. want to push along the uh the character development of wendy right yeah. Uh, yeah and and not not focus i mean we do focus a ton on jack but but we are mo- we are definitely developing and moving wendy forward quite um efficiently uh, as well yeah i agree and i love her i love this character i really yeah. do yeah me too so the drink brings danny back enough to to talk more and he decides he's going to tell them the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth he comes fully clean about the shining about everything he's been seeing in the hotel uh, the visions he's had because of tony also the things he's seen on the wall the presidential suite he tells them all of it and and wendy in this moment decides to open up too she tells jack up front straight that all of his drinking habits have come back and he's spending all the time in this basement not working on the play and she's really really worried about him and everyone is, is is finally, finally, finally being honest with each other. And it's so kind of comforting. And, and again, we get to this point of like, oh, this is this is a point where everything could possibly work out. Except one person is not being honest because here we go. Jack says, what about the playground? I don't know. The playground, he said, and the hedge animals. Jack jumped a little and Wendy looked at him curiously. Have you seen anything down there, Jack? No. He said, nothing. Danny was looking at him. Nothing, he said again, more calmly. And that was true. He had been a a victim of a hallucination. And that was all. (sighs) I I love the beat of Danny looking at him, too, because you know Danny knows Mm -hmm. or probably can feel that he's lying. Mm -hmm. Or there's at least that there's something more there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And so, Matt, when we look at this, I think we're, we're, we're officially, you know, over halfway through this book at this point now. And if we start to imagine the stuff in Dark Tower terms, we have here our, our Torrance Catet. And like in Wolves of the Kala here halfway through the book, we have all of our characters finally realizing that they're only hurting the Tet by, by keeping secrets from each other. They're coming together. They're pledging to be honest with each other and tell everyone the way it is. And, and it, we it breeds this hopeful moment for the future. And, and, and Jack looks at this, he looks at this brave honesty from Wendy who, who, who tells Jack that she believes that their son is magic. 
uh, but also that she's been increasingly afraid of him and for him because of his behavior. We see this incredible bravery from a traumatized Danny who who is risking the men in the white coats, which is a thing we learned earlier that he was very, very, very afraid of by telling all this stuff. He was very afraid this was going to be the reaction. He's risking this now to tell his parents the truth about what he is, what he can do and what he sees. And in return for all this bravery, all this honesty, does Jack tell them about the hedge animals? Does Jack tell them about the way he's been feeling? He's been off. Does Jack tell him about the, 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 the voices he heard in the radio, the people he felt in the bar? Does Jack tell them anyway, anything? No, he says nothing because it was just a hallucination and that's all. And that's your moment, right? That's your, your moment of breaking of our content. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. Um, I, I was feeling all of these emotions that you're describing, although I wasn't necessarily, you know, uh, uh, describing them in my head as I was feeling them. But no, you're, you're mm-hmm. spot on with with like what the arc of the scene is, um, because, you know, in this moment, we, we do get the immense satisfaction of our characters coming clean with each other and mm-hmm. having these important conversations. And it's a it's a relief. Right. And King yeah. knows that. Uh, and he, you're also right that he uses this in a lot of his novels, this idea that that we we feel relieved we feel a release of tension when our characters finally have these necessary conversations, mm-hmm. except one of them isn't doing it. Jack is doubling down on his paranoid secretiveness and, you know, probably passes up the last chance to save the Torrance Cotet. Yeah. And it's like, we, we've all just kind of admitted to ourselves that our son has magic powers. Right. Uh-huh. So like, like I think maybe in some versions of the world, you can see like, no, I don't need to tell them about these these moving hedge animals. But when your son, who has just told you he has magical powers, and just told you that he talked to another man with magical powers that said something happened with the hedge animals, then you can maybe start to be like, okay, maybe I actually just did see them move. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe I have to wrestle with the fact that I'm living in a world now where hedge animals move and my son can hear my thoughts. Uh-huh. And uh, Wendy has gotten there. She's yeah. there. Um, but he has not. Yeah, interest it, it's it's interesting. It's almost like you know, we we've sort of guessed that Jack does have the shining and I think we're probably going to have proof of that by the end of this week's reading. Mm-hmm. And it's like he he's so shut to the possibility of the supernatural and and, and these and these things and, and it's mm-hmm. like well maybe that's part of his being shut to his his shining. It's, it's he's he's he is um almost irrationally biased away from ever considering such things. Um, yeah. Yeah. So not only does he not come clean with them, he's he, what's more, he's going to leave them because he decides in this moment that the thing he needs to do more than anything is to go do his job. Because if there's a woman living in room 217, a, an absurd, ridiculous thing to think mm-hmm. because no, no way. Uh, his, it's his job to go find her and, and kick her out of the hotel. I guess <laughs> that's his plan. Uh, and when Wendy, <laughs> Wendy tries to stop him here and look what happens. Don't you dare leave us alone. She shrieked at him. Spittle flew from her lips with the force of the cry. Jack said, Wendy, that's a remarkable imitation of your mom. You son of a fucking bitch. Uh-huh. Like, this is what I, I love about this. When you, when you establish these characters, one of the first things we learned about Jack from Wendy and one of the things that, that she loved about him the most is that he understood the relationship between her and her mother and how broken and terrible it was. And he helped her break free of that relationship. And so to use that in this moment, to play that card, to just, just to hurt her Mm -hmm. is unforgivable. Almost. It's, it's a totally, you know, pointless, petty, shitty thing to say. Uh, I think unforgivable is right because it's the kind of thing where it's like, you you don't say that unless you just don't care anymore mm-hmm. like it, 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 that kind of thing y- using a person's vulnerability against them yeah. when they're supposed to be your loved one it's like yeah we've we've crossed the line here and, and really mm-hmm. I, I do think this week's reading is just a series of jack crossing lines um, yeah and we're not even really done yet but i think that was a that was a that was a pretty um it seems like such a minor thing because it's just a thing that he says but it's it seems pretty uh irrevocable um yeah uh yeah fucking asshole yeah um 
And then our, our chapter ends with with Danny saying he'll be okay because he, he doesn't have the shining and, and the things can't hurt you if you don't have the shining. Um, which is uh-huh. <laughs> 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 no, that's a great way to to wrap that because I mean that's that's kind of a cliffhanger too, really, because you're like, oh, uh oh. Uh, so we move on to chapter thirty two seventeen revisited, uh, one of the scariest chapters of a novel I've ever read. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so the I, I I read this chapter this week at eleven thirty p.m. laying <laughs> in my bed alone because my uh-huh. wife is asleep. And it still got me, man. It still got me it, uh-huh. every time. It just works. Yeah, I've read this book so many times; it still works. It's great. I really love it. Yeah. All right, Matt. So a curious thing happens at the start of this chapter. Jack takes the elevator up to room two seventeen. He notes that nobody has stepped foot on this thing since their original ride with Ullman. But in this moment, Jack decides to take it here. Why do you think that is? I mean, the first thing that pops in my head is is the elevator game from, from the dream. You know, the, the dream sure. reminds him of the elevator, so why not take it? And you could push it farther. You could say the hotel is sort of being identified with Jack's father um, as well as with Jack's drinking and Jack's father's drinking and so forth. Yeah, And, and so the, the hotel is sort of lifting Jack up the way his father used to. I think all of this is 100% true and I love it. Um, for For a pure just like petty jack reason we see here that he says wendy's terrified of this elevator and so he's trying to make a distinction between himself and her by saying i'm gonna use the elevator because i'm not afraid of everything like i love he says here nothing in the overlook frightened him he felt he and it were simpatico (laughs) remarkable (laughs) oh sure jack sure so jack turns the corner and sees 217 ajar the pass key hanging from the lock still and he decides that the most important thing to do in this moment is to get angry at his son for disobeying him because he hasn't gone through enough. Um, I, this is like, I think you're right that this is a bunch of line crossing. And I think what we're doing is crossing the line of Jack is just turning into the antagonist of the mm-hmm. story. And and this is another one of those moments where you're just like, Jesus, because he says he would talk to Danny about that just as soon as the boy was over his fright. He would talk to him reasonably, but sternly. There were plenty of fathers who would have done more than just talk. They would have ministered a good shaking, and perhaps that was what Danny needed. If the boy had gotten a scare, wasn't that at least his just desserts? He didn't just have a fright or a good scare. He was catatonic for like half an hour. Uh You asshole. He he has bruises on his neck. Yeah, he got choked. Yeah, it's it really – I mean this is part of the thing is it's like Jack is – becoming almost willfully blind to more and more things mm-hmm. um and just just managing to not notice obvious things in, in his in his train of thought which is part of his deterioration i think um but yeah this is you know jack king rather slowly turning the dial further and further into the mm-hmm. jack sucks direction with yep. with fewer and fewer you know nudges back in the other direction to make us sympathize with him yeah So Jack walks into the room and sees nothing out of the ordinary. He walks into the bathroom and sees nothing. But as he approaches the tub, a feeling sweeps over him. The shower curtain, a pallid pastel pink, was drawn protectively around the long claw-footed tub. Nevertheless, they did move. And for the first time, he felt his new sense of sureness, almost cockiness, that had come over him when Danny ran to him shouting, It was her! It was her! Deserting him. A chilled finger pressed gently against the base of his spine, cooling him off ten degrees. It was joined by others as they suddenly rippled all the way up his back to his medulla oblongata, playing his spine like a jungle instrument. Uh, God, that's such good writing. Yeah, I I love, in particular, I I love pallid pastel pink. You know, first of all, great alliteration. Yeah. Second, it's the most innocuous color in the world, actually, pallid Mm -hmm. pastel. But like pallid in this context conjures images of like dead flesh yeah, um, yeah. rather than just a, a pleasant little pink bathroom um it's <laughs> yeah. it's just it's just great my favorite part of this though is the nevertheless they did move parenthetical here mm-hmm. um because there's no reference point for this and and a super sharp reader could possibly have seen that in the moment and known immediately what it's referencing uh which is the hedge animals of course mm-hmm but I don't actually think it's designed that you catch up on that immediately because a bit later in the, the the chapter, he says it again 
and the, and then clarifies it. It says, yes, like the hedges, nevertheless, they did move. And so it's that's like answering the question. Because I think in the moment, what it does is just inject this almost non sequitur thought into the middle of this thing. Like he's looking at this cloth with a tub and suddenly, nevertheless, they did move. And you're just like, wait, what? Like, wh- wh- where did... What yeah. did, what do you mean? Where did that come from? What what is that? I don't understand. I don't get it. And it just kind of throws you off in the exact kind of way Jack is thrown off. Um, I just think it's super super effective. Yeah, the use of parentheticals in Jack's thinking um, as a consistent way of communicating intrusive, often correct and useful thoughts into Jack's usual maze of of copes is great. I, I I've. I don't know if I can say this is a theory because I don't think it's really consistent actually, but I was working on a, an idea that the parentheticals are like Jack's shine trying to, to, to burst through and in, into his consciousness um, because they do often tend to be like the stuff that he's avoiding thinking about, but, but that mm-hmm. he should be. And it's like, if, if he does have the shining and, and if, you know, if his subconscious is trying to channel this helpful information to him, um, but he has he has suppressed it so long that it can only leak through in these yeah. intrusive parentheticals. Again, I don't really know if it works or if it's consistent, but it was a thought that came to me. Yeah, no, I think that that's certainly reasonable. Cool. Um, but of course, Matt, the tub is dry. It's it's empty. There's a bath mat on the floor, which there should not be. All of those were were packed up and moved to the closet down the hall. But it's an easily explainable mistake by a rushing maid. You know, there's nothing. There's nothing here at all. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Except he smells the faint hint of lady soap fresh on the air. That's that's, that's weird. Huh. Soap. Huh. And as he turns to leave the bathroom, he hears a noise. And he turns back and we get this wonderful writing. The shower curtain, which he had pushed back to look into the tub, was now drawn. The metallic rattle, which had sounded to him like a stir of bones in the crypt, had been the curtain rungs on the overhead bar. Jack stared at the curtain. His face felt as if he had been heavily waxed, all dead skin on the outside, live hot rivulets of fear on the inside, the way he had felt on the playground. There was something behind the pink plastic shower curtain. There was something in the tub. He could see it, ill-defined and obscure through the plastic, a nearly amorphous shape. It could have been anything, a trick of the light, the shadow of the shower attachment, a woman long dead and reclining in her bath. A bar of Loella and one stiffening hand as she waited patiently for whatever lover might come. <laughs> uh, yeah. It could be anything. Yeah. A trick of the light, a shadow, a dead uh-huh. woman hanging out there with a piece of soap in her hand. It, it could be anything. Yeah, yeah. Just going to back slowly away and just put this all behind you. Uh-huh. It's nothing. It's nothing. I love his face felt as if it had been heavily waxed, all dead skin on the outside, live hot rivulets of fear on the inside. That's a wonderful description. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So Jack uh, gets the fuck out of there, immediately walks out uh, and and sees the door to the room has now been shut, just like <laughs> his son did. Uh, he, of course, tries the door and closes it behind him and locks it. And then we get this. From inside, he seemed to hear an odd, wet thumping sound, far off, dim, as if something had just scrambled belatedly out of the tub, as if to greet a caller, as if it had just realized the caller was leaving before the social amenities had been completed, and so it was now rushing to the door, all purple and grinning, to invite the caller back inside, perhaps forever. Footsteps approaching the door, or only a heartbeat in his ears? Ah! Oh my god. (laughs) The so this it's so great. It works so well. One thing I love about it is that it's always it, right? Uh-huh. It uh-huh. N- never never her. Um, yeah, that's that makes it way better for some reason. Um, I do want to figure out like like why this works so well in particular, and there's a lot honestly. But one of the things I want to pull out is is just like once again, this is about what is not shown but only yeah. implied mm-hmm. you know that the ghost is never as scary as as the suggestion of the ghost that you're left you're left to fill in the blanks of what exactly was or was not there um i just happened to find this painting on twitter of, of all places uh in the last week or two uh, and the painting is called demos by the painter dragon bibin 
Um, and I've put it in the script to, to share it with you. And we can probably post it somewhere on the website to, to share it as well or link to it. But the, the description of the, of the painting is, is, is just that there's, um, there's a, a, an open doorway opening into darkness and in the foreground is a, is a dog and you're, you're just, you're mainly, you know, the focus of the painting is, is the dog and it's standing in this alert, wary position, staring into the darkness of the open door. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's such a great painting because it captures what I'm trying to, to express here, which is, it, this is way scarier than if you showed like a, a, a grinning goblin face in the dark in, in 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 that doorway, right? No. It's it's the darkness and the idea of like what's out there. It's mm-hmm. the question. It's the it's the leaving you to fill in the blank. That is, I think, some of the best of of King's horror is when he leaves a little bit of that ambiguity for us, and that's what he's done here. That's that's why I love this. Is we don't we don't really know exactly what what just happened, right? So yeah. our imagination kicks into overdrive, um, and that's that's to me what makes this scene really sing. I, I agree with you. The, the thing that also really activates the scariest for me is this use of sound, mm-hmm. and it's so it's so fascinating to talk about the use of sound in a in a written format that there is no there is no actual literal sound here. But the way he describes the odd, wet thumping sound, the way he describes the footsteps approaching the door, or only a heartbeat, I can hear it. I can hear it all. And I think that activates your imagination in a really interesting way because I think the, the reason why this is so much scarier than if you saw that that grinning face in this doorway is because our imaginations are incredibly powerful things. And storytellers and stories are incredibly powerful as well. But but stories can kind of only hope to activate our imagination and let our imagination run with it. And that's exactly what's happening here because I can see, I can see this 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 horrible monstrous dead corpse woman like suddenly and quickly getting out of the shower and like rushing greedily towards the door like i can see it all i can hear it i can feel it i can feel it happening and we don't ha- we don't need to see it we just need to know it potentially is happening yeah and it's horrifying yeah yeah right no it's it's uh it's great i love it love it so much yeah seriously one of the scariest moments i've ever read uh uh, in in a book ever Mm -hmm. um it's it's, god it's so good i love it i love it so much god i love this book yeah me too so jack locks the door and stands there terrified he then forces himself to back away from 217 and downstairs again he takes a quick moment to eye the fire extinguisher hose that definitely moved positions while he was in 217 and basically just goes nope not uh, <laughs> not doing doing that right now. <laughs> nope. Uh-huh. And he walks away. I love that the, the text takes the time to point out that he he takes the stairs, not the elevator. His his confidence at his lack of fear of the overlook is at least temporarily gone. Yeah, he doesn't trust the elevator not to uh, toss him up over its head like his dad mm-hmm. used to. Yeah. So chapter 31, titled The Verdict. This is a short half-page chapter to wrap up the week. Jack basically just goes back down to the kitchen, sees his poor, traumatized son, exhausted and terrified wife, and decides the best thing to do in this moment is to lie to them both. He says, nothing there. He said, astounded by the hardiness of his voice. Not a thing. Uh, I felt such a powerful stab of hate for this fictional character at this moment. Really, really remarkably strong level of hate for this fictional character who doesn't actually exist, <laughs> which is, again, why I love this book so much. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, you know, you could argue, I guess, if you wanted, if you wanted to construct an argument that the, the, the thing that happened to them with the hedge animals could be explained away as a hallucination. And so mm-hmm. the idea that that's something that he felt he didn't need to share has a certain amount of logic to it um, that is not like Danny's experiences. And so he just didn't need to share but this what just happened to him here the curtain drew back Mm -hmm. jack (laughs) like you had opened the curtain it drew back you had left the door open it was closed like you heard the thump like you experienced this man and you chose again it's almost as if like king is is handing him one last rope right one one last chance Okay, you fucked up that last time. You crossed that line with what you said to your wife. But here it is. Again, you could come to them and say, 
I saw it. I know something was in there and something hurt you and we got to get you out of here. Uh But instead, nothing there. Yeah. Not a thing. Yeah. It's the final line to be crossed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we see actually that heartbreakingly, this makes them both feel better. Uh, Wendy, because you know, she, she's not entirely up on this. Oh, the hotel's evil and trying to kill me thing. And and Danny, because his father just went there and checked it out. And if daddy says it's okay, then it's okay. Yeah. Just like if he says the car is going to make it into the mountains, then it will. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Still trust his daddy. Yep. And I love Matt that this chapter is called the verdict because you could say it's like the verdict of, of what Jack saw in 217, right? He's coming down to deliver the verdict, right? But it also could be the book's verdict coming down on Jack after he makes this choice, right? That the book at this point has said, we find the defendant Jack Torrance guilty Mm -hmm. i love that i mean i i sort of lean that direction actually Mm because because it's like the verdict if the verdict is meant to be the verdict on whether there's a creature in in the room then Mm -hmm. then it's it's a it's a mockery because yeah there is a creature in the room but but he lies Mm -hmm. um so the verdict is that jack is a liar yeah yeah right yep and that is the end of this week's reading oh boy that was a fun one (laughs) Yeah, no, that was amazing. Um, just r- really remarkable. Really loving this book so far. Me too. Me too. We will pick it up next week with chapters 32 through 37. Uh, we're, we're making our way through, Matt. As I said, we are officially uh, halfway through the book at this point. Um, nice. We've actually, I think, only got one, two, three, four more, four more episodes uh, of, of book proper before we're on our, on our uh, over, over, view thingy so man it's gonna it's gonna happen fast from here yeah wow okay yeah all right let's move into our discussion questions section last week we asked the question what are some other instances of characters succumbing to bad compulsive behavior we compared this to both jack and danny being compelled to do some things that they knew they shouldn't uh matt uh, how, where, how would the answers go how'd the algorithm do uh the algorithm did did very well the algorithm performed admirably um <laughs> <laughs> so so first we have uh from scantron 093 uh in my interpretation one of the oldest examples of this is the scorpion and the frog the ancient equivalent to passengers vomiting in your uber <laughs> the reckless scorpion can't even wait until his trip across the water is complete before killing his chauffeur you can compare this to the farmer and the viper where the snake attacks someone that showed pity because he's just a dick like that but the scorpion is a bit more sympathetic because he attacks even knowing from the start that he would doom himself to a watery grave, suggesting that self-interest took a backseat to a more primal force. After all, it's in my nature. <laughs> it's a good example. I, I, I agree with that. I always hated that story. I mean, yeah. I love it, but I hate it. Cause well, exactly. Well, that that's, it's like the, it's a perfect, it's a perfect archetype. Our archetypal story of, of what we're talking about right because like watching characters do do self-destructive compulsive things you you know as the reader you, your usual response is like no no why what is wrong with you which is exactly <laughs> what you feel from the scorpion and the frog yeah yeah uh just stand 8460 says having recently revisited an old high school favorite and cult classic donnie darko i have to mention the compulsion donnie undergoes at various times in the film he is first compelled to leave his home in the night and buy a demonic bipedal night by a demonic bipedal bunny named frank who informs him that there's a very specific amount of time remaining until the end of the world as a fan i know this actually refers to the tangent universe in which the entire remainder of the film takes place as well as the primary universe Man, I need to I need to watch Darny Darko again. Uh, when, <laughs> when the time expires, it will be the end of all existence forever, if not remediated by the chosen receiver, Donnie Darko himself. What the hell kind of name is that? Like some sort of superhero or something? This is all deep stuff, which I will spare you of. If you want to know more, ask Robert Sparrow, a.k.a. Gra- Grandma Death, or read her book. It's all in there. Later, he is compelled to flood his school, leading to him meeting Gretchen, a pivotal person who will bring about his eventual bring about his eventual slaying of the real Frank and also figuring out his own purpose as the receiver. Third instance is to burn down Jim Cunningham's house, exposing his sick perversions. I absolutely love these compulsive scenes. The ominous and haunting distortion and cadence to Frank's voice works on me every time. Wake up, Donnie. Come closer. Closer. I also go through inevitable tears of fears kicks every time I watch it. Who's with me? 
Um, I think I watched Donnie Darko once with you in college. I'm pretty sure we watched it together. Yeah, and we did watch it together, but that was not the first time that I had watched it. It um, was the first time I had. But it is a very difficult movie to understand. But you're totally right that that it is it carries with it that that feeling yet again of of you're watching this character do things and you don't understand why he's doing them. Sometimes he sometimes he's clearly like in a fugue. Sometimes he's just kind of a he's just kind of a weird character, so he's doing things that you wish he wouldn't do. Um, it's uh, I don't know how I feel about that movie. I think I probably haven't watched it since college. It's a it's a weird movie for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do wonder how like older, able to understand things better Scott would would do because I just have very I have very little memory of it because I just I don't think I got it. <laughs> Yeah, I think you'd I think you'd get it. I'm not sure if you'd like it, to be sure. honest. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a really really interesting. I mean, Gyllenhaal, man. Yeah, why not? Mm-hmm. I love Gyllenhaal. Yeah. All right. Next, uh, Tin Tin Bug Doc. Tin Tin Bug Doc. I always try to figure out if there's some like hidden meanings of the names, but I don't I don't, I don't see it. Um, this user says the beauty of compulsion as a theme lies in its ancient roots all the way back to Eve picking the apple. My recent read of Stephen Fry's Troy has rekindled my love for the writings of Homer, in this case, the Iliad. Compulsion is the driving force behind so many of the wonderful characters. Paris compelled by pride, Helen by love, Menelaus by jealousy, Agamemnon by ambition, Achilles by the drive for fame, Hector by duty, the panoply of Olympian gods all by their petty vices, and so on and so on across the characters. So many plot lines repeated in later literature play out in this truly epic tale in the 10 years of the Trojan War. Love that. You know, we just covered um, the Song of Achilles over on the book club last month. Yeah, and, so um, a novelization of uh, the uh, Patroclus. Oh, damn it, I said it right. I said it wrong. Patroclus. Patroclus, yeah. I'm sorry. Achilles. Yeah, published. and... Which which is also the story of Achilles, more or less, um, mm-hmm. and and the others. I it's funny. I wasn't thinking about it in terms of compulsion, but yeah, you are watching these characters driven to do self destructive things. Um, Absolutely, that's, yeah, that's true. Next, we have Leah two seventeen who says we could talk about Jake compulsively opening doors to find his way back to Roland after not dying, but I'm re-listening to Rose Matter at the moment, and I am more horrified by Norman as in Bates, Daniels, in my opinion, one of the most terrifying villains in a Stephen King book. So I'm going with his compulsive torturing and killing, especially how he kills Thumper and doesn't even remember what he was doing. Um, we are not going to cover Rose Matter on this show, Matt, but uh-huh. it is really... like King has created a lot of monstrous characters. Norman Daniels is definitely near the top of the list. Like He's just... Wow. Um he's awful. He's awful. Sounds sounds fun. <laughs> like I, I just like I you've you've met some of some of the, the the worst characters King has to offer. Not all of them, but some of them. And he will kick the crap out of any of those. It's kind of alarming how just how fucking terrible this guy is. Interesting. Okay. Well, um I maybe I'll read that on my own somewhere down the line it's an interesting book i mean i think maybe maybe hold off until we get to the 90s because it's it's one of the it's one of his interesting experiments in the 90s that's worth at least tangentially talking about cool all right sounds good all right uh toscat nine five uh sorry seven five nine four says i'm sure i could come up with plenty of examples but since i literally just finished it today for the first time i'm going to bring up under the dome um Stop me if there's any spoilers here, Scott. The story itself kept me absorbed the whole time, but there sure are a ton of garsh darn cotton picking idiots in Chester's Mill. It's pretty obvious very quickly that Big Jim Rennie has the town by the balls even before the dome fell. Once it got to the point where it is obvious that there is basically nothing he wouldn't uh, do to cover his ass, you'd think people would use more caution when trying to confront him even after people start getting killed and bodies being found. Literally every single person who confronts him does it alone and unarmed, even when told not to, or having proof of, of murder. It's my one big gripe with the book. Like, seriously, how many bodies need to be found before you gather up a posse? Um, yeah, I mean, but uh, the, no, no spoilers there, Matt. You're safe. Okay. But, um, I think that's part of what the book is saying, that mm-hmm. how people are, as as we'll use the, the wording of this discussion question, compelled 
to stick by this this awful human being. Yeah, or maybe not that I've read the book, but but maybe maybe compelled to try to follow the rules of civil society even after it's no longer appropriate to do so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you keep on atrocian says I listen to this podcast while I'm at work and I immediately thought of needful things. I haven't had time, unfortunately to reference the book, but if I recall correctly, every character acts out a compulsion. Leland Gaunt plays on these weaknesses, causing the chaos that results. Yeah, you're definitely right. You don't, we don't need specific instances, but you're absolutely right that like at very least the, the trinkets that he sells to these people lead them to compulsive behavior. Like just their, their kind of obsession with these items, with these objects compels yeah. them um and it's it's definitely all about our our it's materiality matt these yeah. material goods that compel us to behave certain ways i mean if we're if we're going to consider that sort of behavior to be the result of compulsion then i i want to say that king is really interested in this theme in general because mm-hmm. he he does this over and over the idea that that people out of a desire for a thing or to keep a secret or a, any number of motives will will drive people to do to do terrible things um and they they almost feel like they can't help it right that's mm-hmm. that's how it always feels from the inside yeah all right uh, the walk in hard case says thinking of answers to this week's discussion question made me realize that giving in to temptation just might be one of my favorite tropes the ironic thing is that these moments can be good bad or both some examples that came to mind jack black and tropic thunder <laughs> know exactly what moment you're thinking about um the yes i am interested in becoming a meth head scene from succession i haven't seen that uh Ro- roland and susan in wizard and glass yeah for sure pretty much all of the godfather i, I feel you pretty much all of Requ- Requ- requiem for a dream 100 percent. that turned out great yep, for goes, everyone yeah everybody had a really good time until they stopped having a good time <laughs> um pretty much all of star wars they say um Interesting. Not sure that yeah, not sure that I see that one as clearly the, the other ones for sure. But um, you know, may, maybe I'm just not not thinking about it right. Um, uh, they, they say there there are many more examples of giving in the temptation for good or ill, played for laughs as a gut punch or both. And then they say, here's my final answer, and this one's for you, Matt. At the end of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, after everything Sam and Frodo have been through, Frodo fails. The ring consumes him. Frodo's final tip into apparent madness and Sam's heartbreaking realization and reaction is a genuinely surprising twist with two huge payoffs. One, it hammers home Tolkien's theme that friends and loved ones are necessary in life. No one can do it alone. Two, we don't know what role those around us have to play. In the end, Bilbo's pity saves our heroes and the world. All of that because Frodo finally succumbed to the, to, um, to the ring. That's some good stuff right there. Once, once again, people trying to make me get choked up in the middle of reading, no Matt's gonna question. love this answer. <laughs> yeah. Love it, yeah. No, that's, that's that's great. That's that's exactly. And, I mean, and, and of course, it's also you know Gollum's compulsion that makes him yeah. go after the ring in the, in the first place. Which, yeah, yeah, exactly. legitimately might be one of my favorite moments in literature ever. And yeah. I think one of the reasons I will always treasure the film so much is I think they nail that that moment so much. And actually, I think Jackson expands upon it because if I'm remembering correctly, I don't think. Gollum and Frodo like fight for the ring like hap like in the book I think F- Gollum bites his finger off gets the ring and is just kind of dancing happily and then slips and falls I think and in the movie they turn that into like a, a fight sequence where they kind of are struggling for the ring and trip over the edge which yeah. I I kind of like a little sorry Tolkien I kind of like a little better actually yeah I think it, I think it makes it more visually compelling and then yeah. I, I don't think there's the bit where Frodo is hanging off the edge and Sam no, has that the, part yeah like, like I don't all, need I, I love that moment but I don't mm-hmm. think the book needed that um but I, I the, yeah. the, the two of them fighting like that at the very end it is it is the the fight over the power that causes the destruction of the thing just feels yeah. perfect to me sure the the hand up thing is a is of course a film match you know match cut basically to earlier when frodo lifts sam out of the water yep, yep. um so it's all it's all very well thought out um mm-hmm, fi- mm-hmm. film wise but yeah i i don't know I, i'm on the same page as you here love it love it great answer uh, odd guarantee 30 says discussion question and please read the preamble after the dash as my brother is working through the first series and i don't want to spoil him eric turn off the episode like right now spoilers for the first law coming <laughs> 
My favorite compulsion is from that series with Logan Nine Fingers occasionally succumbing to his alter ego, the Bloody Nine. Occasionally in battle, Logan will succumb to his bloodlust and become the Bloody Nine. He then has a compulsion to kill. When this happens, he is the enemy of any living thing, glorying, glorifying in the violence and cackling with laughter as he is sprayed by the viscera of friends, enemies, children, and flatheads alike. Say one thing for Logan Nine Fingers. Say he's a killer. Yep. Finished those books recently. and I gotta, I gotta get get on the second too i just read the first with you for book club and i haven't read the next two yet it's uh that's a very accurate description man that book made me feel all the feelings yeah. that, that that series that's a mm -hmm. that's a that's a series man that is, is a series of books it is well it's a book the first it, one is yes it, that book made me feel a lot of things so yeah. if what you say is true about yeah. where it goes from there I that's why i went ahead and read the rest because I, I loved mm -hmm. it eric you can turn the podcast back on now yep <laughs> that's how that works <laughs> Uh, Welcome Dude 22 says, many of literature's great characters are, dr are driven by compulsive behavior in books. The example that comes to mind is Guy Montag in Fahrenheit for 51. He is a fireman in a world where a fireman's job is to burn books with all their dangerous and confusing ideas. He knows and enforces the laws against having books, sometimes burning the reader along with their literary caches. Caches, sorry. <laughs> um... That's that's that one that always gets me. Still, guy finds himself fascinated. There must be something in books, things we can't imagine, to make a woman stay in a burning house. There must be something there. You don't stay for nothing. Occasionally, at a book burning, his hands do a trick, hiding a book under his fireman's jacket. It turns out he has been taking books home from work for a while, hiding them in his ductwork, ductwork, afraid to read them. It is interesting that when he decides to finally read them. His wife also behaves compulsively and turns him into the fire department. In movies, my favorite example is Michael Myers in the original Halloween. He has a driving compulsion to stalk and kill women. He kills his sister when he is a child and then spends the next 15 years locked up with his pale, expressionless face, not saying a word, staring at the wall, through the wall, into the future with his dark eyes, the devil's eyes, waiting for Halloween night when he can be free. Um, dun, dun. Uh, yeah um no that's that's great um but yeah i think that does apply that's very the michael myers example is very different from uh what we've been thinking about yeah well it, the thing that i love about the michael myers thing is it, he's certainly compelled but we don't ever really understand why or at least in the in the the movies you want to yeah. choose to be canon because there's a lot of dipping and changing and morphing of of the whys of that whole series and at least in the first one there's no reason for it it's yeah. just compulsion and it's part of the point yeah. that it's just just rationalist reasonless compulsion to kill yeah we never we never in that movie get told like oh it's demonic possession it's, mm -mm. it's like no he's just a no. yeah just happened and laurie's not his sister in no. in that movie no, that we've, we've undone that whole part yeah that wouldn't make any sense <laughs> Uh, last but not least, we have Jen Cat D, who says the first thing that comes to mind for compulsion is Craig Toomey in the Langoliers tearing his paper. More specifically, Bronson Pinchot has Craig Toomey tearing his paper. The rolly eyes, doughy complexion, metered breath, sheen of sweat. He played the absolute need to tear so well. A train wreck of an adaptation that I will watch every single time. I love it. I love it so it's much. So, it's so bad. It's so bad. I know. I know I told the story before, but I always think about when we watched that movie when it came on TV back in mm -hmm. the 90s. And my little cute, adorable five-year-old brother, one time we're just sitting at the dinner table and he just starts, he rolls his eyes back and he starts tearing his <laughs> napkin. And, and we all just lost it because, it, it, yeah, it was perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. No notes. All right. Thank you so much, everyone who sent those questions in. Uh, sorry to the people that didn't get selected this week by the, the holy algorithm. Uh, your your chance will come, we promise. Yes. But uh, thank you, everyone. I, we still do read as, as many as the questions as we can. I think I read all of them this week, and it's always great to see your responses. Keep those coming. And if you haven't noticed, we've also been posting those questions on social media, on our, our Instagram, on Twitter, uh, I think on Facebook as well. So if, if you prefer to answer there, uh, they're usually a little bit late and won't necessarily be read on the show, but we still we're seeing them. You can share them with with the rest of the listeners. Yeah. All right, Matt, it's time for this week's question. What are we asking the audience this week? So what is your favorite uh, scene where we have a main character who is losing their marbles? Mm -hmm. um, this, of course, inspired by Jack 
losing his marbles um, as as we watch. I can think of off the top of my head at least one other Stephen King character who fits this bill. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it could, could be a film, could be a book, uh, could be anything really, um, you know, uh, uh, just basically I, I think it's interesting to consider the different ways in which we depict this this phenomenon in fiction. Yeah. No, I am looking forward to seeing everyone's response to that one. Please make sure you just send those in early because the algorithm begins its its unholy work uh, early in the week. Yes, it begins chewing and doesn't stop. <laughs> We're going to create a whole Stephen King character out of this thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, All right, folks, that is it for us this week. Next week, The Shining will continue with chapters 32 through 37. Uh, make sure you read them and join us next Thursday for more amazing, incredible talk. I was told I need to be more positive about our content. So Yeah just amazing yes yeah just uh, un, unparalleled yes remember you can reach us via the scrum trillescent email address kingslingerspod <laughs> at gmail.com or on twitter at kingslingerspod and of course uh, the subreddit on at r slash doof media is probably the safest way to get us those discussion question answers yeah you should also subscribe to this um because you know there's why not <laughs> got nothing better to do right yeah make sure you follow us on those socials too because we do if we have scheduling updates and stuff we've uh, missed our other podcast for two weeks running now because uh, the first week matt was sick and then last week i came down with a, a healthy bit of the flu uh, uh-huh. at the end of the week didn't affect this show fortunately but it did affect some of our other stuff so if you ever want updates on what what's going on with our schedule social media is the place to do it yeah, it has been considerate of our illnesses to work around Kingslingers specifically. I know. I, know. It, it, I like we're being like dead serious here. It's just <laughs> it's just literally happened that way. Yeah, yeah. If you like uh, Kingslingers and you want to support us, then please consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks to new patrons this week, Jin, Belegdal, and Bobby J and Basani. Uh, welcome. We hope you enjoy the stuff we have over there on the Patreon. And I think we're going to have a new other levels of the tower ready for y'all uh, next week. So this time next week, there should be a new new episode of that ready for all you patrons. So if you haven't become a patron and want to hear us talk about 1922, next week will be the time to do it. Or now, when, whichever you mm-hmm. want to do. Yep. <laughs> but of course, if you cannot afford to help us out, that is totally okay. You can help us by sharing this podcast, uh, talking about us on that lovely thing we call social media. And uh, and you can always help us out by leaving a rating and a review. We do not have a new review to read this week, Matt. So we're in the danger zone. We're in the, the in, in tribute to Fahrenheit um, 451. We're in the book burning zone. So uh, we need to get those new reviews in. Yeah. Where Matt's going to have to be forced to proverbially set fire to a Stephen King book and never get to read it ever again for the rest of his life. I think what happens is the algorithm in its insatiable hunger eats one of the books and then and then it's just gone. Yeah. Like the Langoliers. Did, like, so will I just forget the book too? I think so. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. I don't like this. <laughs> get, get those reviews in, folks. Yeah. Do it for Pet Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is it for us this week. We will see you back here next week for more shining long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Bye.